Hey family, my name is Cassandra. I'm from Trenton, New Jersey, and this is my story. Started off, so I'm gonna take y'all way back from like before I was even here on this earth, okay? Let's really get down to the nitty gritty. Um, you know, my mom was actually on her way to the abortion clinic with me in her stomach. So the truth is, you know, I'm, I wasn't supposed to be here at all. But the crazy thing is, and the way how God works is, you know, on the way to the, to the abortion clinic, she kept getting obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, construction, construction you know, car accidents, all of this stuff was happening. And she kind of got the epiphany at that moment, like, I'm not supposed to be doing this. She knew that I would be her promised child. Um, she actually had a dream about exactly what I was going to look like. And, you know, coming out, I'm the only one that came out fair skinned with green eyes. And, you know, so I, it was something about me that was just different. And she knew it. Everybody knew it. Um, moving forward, you know, um, growing up in Trent. And I remember when I was two years old, y'all, let me tell y'all about the, you know, just the opposition that I had to face just in life, period. Um, I remember I was two years old and I, um, I was in the bathroom with my sister. You know, I have four sisters and a brother. And um, I was in the bathroom with my sister and she started running hot water. And I don't know what it was about Jersey or that neighborhood, but the water was extremely hot. It was extremely hot and she tried to put me in a bath. And when she tried to put me in a bath, I got burned really, really bad all on my leg. And um, somehow, some way, I don't even remember, but Dyfus ended up getting called and they rushed to the house. I remember my mom and my aunts all rushing to try to get the house together and keep the house clean and clean up real quick, get everything organized. Um, I remember them putting things on my leg to try to suppress the burn and make it not look like it was nothing. But um, even in that moment, you know, it was like already another attack. The enemy trying to get me out of here, trying to separate me from my family, already trying to get me in a place where I'm not supposed to be. And, um, you know, I remember my mom was just so scared in that moment, not knowing what was going to happen to me. Um, but thank God, you know, things turned around and, and, and here I am. But um, fast forward a little bit. My father, he actually was in my life for a couple years up until maybe five or six years old. Um, but he ended up just leaving us. Um, I've seen my father beat my mom many times. I remember times I would be jumping on his back, like, get off of mama, get off of mama. And, um, you know, that, that could do something to you, right? Like seeing, I'm a kid, I'm like five, four years old, and I'm seeing my mom, my, my mom get abused by um, um, my father. So it was, it was, it was hard. Um, but when I was about five or six years old, he actually ended up leaving us. Mind you, my mom, single mother, five kids out here in the hood, basically. You know, she's at this point got to just do her best to make ends meet, do her best to take care of these five children, do her best to make sure we got a roof over our head, clothes on our back, food on the table. You know, and mama was a hustler. And that's where I get my hustler mentality from, because mama made it happen. No matter what she had to do, she did what she had to do. Um, you know, that, that was hard when my, my dad left us. Um, just being a kid, having dad there, despite all the other things, and then to wake up one day and he's not there at all, and then years go by, you don't see him, you don't hear from him, you don't know where you're going out. It can build up like feelings of rejection or feelings of like, dang, like what did I do or why? my father's not here with me, right? Um, and what's so crazy about this whole thing with my dad is like, my mom did such an amazing job of making us feel like we were living luxury. My, I, that's what I'm saying. In hindsight, when I look back, it's like, I, I don't even realize how bad we was actually living. Like, <laughs> you know, cause mama did a good job at making sure everything was, was good. Like we ate, we had our little game systems back in, you know, um, and we, we were good. You know, we was like little street kids. So we'd be out there all day in the streets playing with the chalk and, you know, doing our thing around the neighborhood and things like that. So she did a great job of making us feel loved despite the circumstances. Right. So, Moving forward a little bit, um, you know, a lot has happened. My brother, he was gang banging. My brother, um, oldest brother, he was the oldest of all five of us. He was out there, you know, in the streets really heavily. Um, you know, I've, I've seen so much in terms of 
just the trauma that my, my, everybody around me had to experience. But for some reason, I was the one that was seeing all the trauma. And I was the one that, you know, not necessarily it happened to me directly, but I was the one witnessing all of it, seeing other people going through their trauma and their hurt and their situations and can do nothing about it. I just had to be there, right? Um, but my brother, you know, he would gangbang. I would see him all the time. Like he would come back bloody in and out of the juvenile systems. We'll be going and, and visiting him in, in juvie and, you know, taking him food and spending time with him and things like that. And, you know, I remember just my uncle, he was in and out heavily on drugs. And, you know, I remember times police busting in our house and I'm there like, what in the world's going on? They coming to arrest my uncle. And um, I've seen him so many times overdose and I've, I've witnessed him, walked in the bathroom with him and he was just out. You know, and again, all of this stuff is going on around me. And I'm just like, man, there's nothing that I can do to help these people, help my family who I love so dearly. Um, so moving forward, you know, we got about the hood. Praise God to mama. She was like, look, enough is enough. OK, <laughs> between everything that's going on with your, your, your sisters, my, even my sisters, they dealt with their own trauma. Um, my little sister, she's dealt with so much trauma, even my mom herself. She's dealt with so much trauma from her mother and things like that. So it was kind of almost looking like it was like a generational thing. Like it just kind of got passed down to the next person and passed down to the next person. And that's what, you know, we, we know now as like generational curses and the enemy really trying to attack our family line. Um, you know, moving forward, I, we moved up out of there. We went to the suburbs area, you know, got away from that. And again, you know, shout out to my mom for trying to really allow us to live a better life, right? She really tried to create a safe space for us to be able to grow into our adulthood, right? And just give us a life that she never had. Um, and for that, I'm just so thankful. So moving forward to... Um, when I moved to, to out of Trenton, we moved to Mooresville, Pennsylvania area, still close to Jersey. But I, even me, like I've, I realize now that all the trauma that I saw around me, I allowed it to affect me in different ways. Like I would get into fights at school. Um, you know, I would like shut people out. You know, I would just, you know, all of this affected me. Right. So that goes to show that the decisions that somebody else makes can affect you. Right. Or decisions that I make in my life can affect the people around me and the people that I love. Um, so moving forward, I, I move out of there and I get to my Mooresville, basically, and I go to middle school there, high school there. Things are OK. I'm still having my things where I'm developing and growing as a teenager, as a, a young girl, still without her dad, still without questions in my mind that are not answered. Um, but then I, I come to a place where. I meet this man named Jordan, y'all. <laughs> I meet this man named Jordan in high school, and um, the rest is history. Hey, my name is Jordan Rambo. I'm from Trenton, New Jersey, and this is my story. So I was separated from my mother at birth. Uh, how this, no, let's go even further back. Let's go even further back. Um, so when my dad met my mother, uh, he was married, he had a family, he had kids. Um, and he ended up stepping out on his wife uh, with my mother. And um, my mom ends up getting pregnant. Uh, and the story was that she ended up getting pregnant. And my dad was like, no, I have a family. You have to get an abortion. And she told him, because I have older brothers, she told him, she said, no, I know the cycle of my children. And if you let me have this baby, I'll give you your first boy. And my dad having all girls, he was like, all right, you know what, we'll just give it a try. And boom, she had me. So long story short, my dad ended up taking me from my mom because all my older brothers were gangbanging. Uh, the story I was told was that he pulled up at the house with my uncle. Like, I'm short. My dad was short. And my uncle's like 6'5". He shows up at the house. My mom's not home. My mom's boyfriend is there. And she's like, he's like, hey, I came for my kid. And uh, my uncle kind of blocked the doorway. My dad walked in and, and took me from my mom. And um, I ended up living with my dad in uh, the Philadelphia area. Um, we were tight. My dad was like, my dad passed away in 2016. But like, he was like my best friend. But um, when we moved to the Philadelphia area, our relationship became tainted because he was working so, more, so much. 
and I lived with his girlfriend. And um, I really just didn't have any guidance. I was learning from everybody that I hung around. Uh, at the age of 13, I started uh, smoking weed. And then 14, 15, I started gangbanging for like protection. And uh, it was just really rough for me. I just remember just being so young, being a young man, just always feeling alone and having to learn from the people that were around me. When I started smoking weed, yeah. I guess like, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood was doing it. So like the older guys that I was with, they were kind of like, man, just smoke, just smoke, you're scared, you're scared. That was the thing they used to get me with. Like, you won't do it, you won't do it. Like, And uh, I think it went from something that I did for fun to something that I, I couldn't function without. And um, we just really had no guidance. I didn't have, you know, my father would always take care of me as far as money went, but I didn't have him physically there. And I think that made all the uh, difference in my decision making and my upbringing. So not having a mother, I always turned my friends, mothers into my mother. And uh, so what I would say to a young person is like, uh, give God a shot. I think like, man, I was looking for answers in all the wrong things. I just always felt empty. And like, I think like growing up, the devil tries to like deceive us young. Like the first thing they tell young men is like, man, you gotta lose your virginity, man. You gotta lose your virginity, that's what it is. You ain't getting no cuckoo, you ain't getting nothing, you ain't doing nothing. And like, I think I went ahead, I lost my virginity. And then they were like, man, smoke this, smoke this, smoke this. And I was like, all right, man, and I got high. And they was like, ah, drink this, drink this. We're gonna turn up, drink this. And then I started drinking and I was still empty. It was like, I was looking for things to fill this void. And then they would say like, man, you need your own car. You need a car, you don't got a car, you don't know. First they would say, oh yeah, you need a job. You need a job. So I got me a little job, making a little money. And then it's like, oh no, you need a car. Then you get the car, you get the girl, you get the job and you're still empty. You get an apartment and you're still empty. And it, like, it wasn't until I gave my life to Christ that life just started making sense. You know what I mean? I feel like I found that comfort that I was looking for since I was a little boy in God. So I would just say to any young person out there, man, just give, like, give God a shot. Like, give Jesus a shot. He, he changed my entire life. I really felt like from a young age, I was just out there just trying to figure it out. You know, I didn't, I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know about God. So it was kind of like a day by day type thing. And whatever happens, happens. Uh, I've had friends die. I've had friends overdose. I've had friends locked up. Uh, I've been arrested before. I've seen people close to me get shot at. So it's been just as a teenager, I was just, I was just trying to find my way. And I just had no structure. I did what I wanted to do when I wanted to do. I got my first tattoos when I was 15. <laughs> I just did what I wanted to do, and uh, I didn't have any, any guidance whatsoever as a teenager. And I would just always look for it in people. I was just willing to gravitate to someone that would teach me something. And I think when I, when I joined the gang as a, as a teenager, I think like my big homie at the time, he made me feel like he cared about me. And I had never experienced that. I think my dad gave me like things and we would talk over the phone and he would come hang out with me once in a while. But like my big homie made me feel like I had purpose. You know what I mean? Even though the things that we were doing wasn't good, he just made me feel like I mattered. And then being a part of the gang, it was like, man, nobody would mess with me. And it was just, I was just out there just trying to figure it out on my own. So we were living in the Philadelphia area and I was just involved with so much at one point and I felt like my dad just couldn't control me. Uh, so he sent me to Jersey. He sent me back to Jersey. I lived in Philly when I was a child. And then he sent me back to Jersey to live with my uh, aunt because he just, he couldn't control me. And that's how I ended up uh, back in Trenton. And then they moved me from Trenton because it was too much. And I ended up in Morrisville and that's where I met my wife. So we met back in 2009, I believe, or was it 08? It was like 08. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. Like it, was, it was way back. Anyway, so I was a freshman in high school, okay. and um, I remember that it was talk around the school about this new kid that came from Philly. So I'm like, who? <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so it was talk around the, the school about it, and I remember um, the first time I actually saw him was... During lunchtime, yeah. I was with my girls, yeah. you know, yeah. and um, he was sitting alone. And then me and my friends, we came up on him and was like, started interrogating him, asking him questions. Yeah. 
So that was the first, my first encounter with him. Yeah. And how I met you. I remember that day, that day too. Y'all was thirsty. Y'all was, <laughs> y'all was thirsty. Not I thirsty. thought they was thirsty. But um, it's so crazy because I tell you this now. Mm-hmm. When I first met her, like, I didn't, when I first saw her, like, I knew she was the one. I think the way I saw her, I had never seen any girl in my life. And it was something so simple, like even it was, she wasn't even fly. She had on like shell tops. She had like shell a, tops was it back in the day. Was, first of all, that was yeah. we stopped sharing wearing shell tops like two years before in <laughs> Philly. But she had like this bun, and like I think the hair was brown, the bun was black, and she had like this white shirt that had paint on it, and the shell tops. And I'm like, it wasn't the external. I looked at her and I just saw confidence. She took her lunch to the uh, trash can, and she had her head up. And I'm like, she just looks so... It was like a slow-mo. Now that I'm thinking back, I'm like, yo, she just looks so confident. And I had never seen... I would never looked at anybody like that. I'm like, something about her is just standing out to me. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy because that, that day I had basketball practice, and she showed up at the practice... And I saw her with somebody that I knew from uh, a long while back, and they were sitting down on the sideline. I think I went to put my phone away because my phone was in my pocket. No, no, no. My phone was, I went to go check my phone. And then she handed it to me, like, huh, my number's in there. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I I took the initiative. I'm Uh like, listen, be cute or whatever. So (laughs) let me give her my number, see how this this go. But she was corny, though. Like we would get, <laughs> we were, corny. <laughs> she was corny. Like we get on the phone, and I'd be like, "Yo, what's up? How you doing?" You know, put my phone voice on, right? Yo, what's up? How you doing? And she's like, "Nothing. I'm good." And that would be it. I'm like, "So you're not gonna talk to me?" Like, what? What's Silence. Up? I was just nervous, y'all. First of all, mind you, we was young. We was like 14. We was kids, you know. So I'm like, on the phone with this boy I like. I'm like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> type thing, you know, but um, moving forward from that, um, we ended up stopping the talk for like a couple months or whatever, and then through a friend, we got reconnected. You know, we would see each other around school still, mm-hmm. but we ended up getting reconnected right. through two of our friends that were dating. Yeah. Our My best friend at the time, his best friend at the time were dating. Yeah. So then we were like, all right, well, here we are again. You know? don't, don't skip over the junkyard kiss. That was, that was when it, that's kiss. leading that up right? to it. Okay. Yeah. 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 First, it's like a movie. I'm telling you, it's like a movie. Yeah, junkyard was a moment. I feel like that was like um, the moment where we realized, like, man, like I really actually like this person. Right. Like I really could like be with this person, and you know, I'm, I'm feeling them. I'm feeling them. You I'm know, feeling that was when we first had like our real kiss, like yeah. in the junkyard at that moment. Yeah, um, yeah nothing else happened, but we just had really our kiss. kiss you know. Like, <laughs> First time we met. Yes, and that was our, our you know, met in point. And then since then, he was actually dating somebody else, and then he had to do a I whole was, thing the same I day. Was. This is how confident he knew he was going to be with me, because he um called the girl when I was there and was like, yeah, you know, this ain't going to work, da 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 And I'm like, yeah, let her know. Let's do this. She's <laughs> like, no, it's okay. At least you were honest. I'm like, nah, like, this ain't going to work. Like, <laughs> This is not going to work. Like, she's like, no, at least you were honest with me that you kissed her and we can make it work. And I'm like, no. Like, we can't. Right, right. I really like her. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, after that, that's kind of where we kind of started to rekind- like, rekindle our relationship. Right. You know, I was out of that, like, boring stage, that corny phase. I was yeah. more open with him and I'm able to, like, express my personality and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, but, and then when I tell y'all, we fell in love. Yeah, we would talk for hours. I we think. fell in love. Like yeah. that crazy kid, teenager love. Like yeah. you can't tell me nothing. Like that's yeah. a love of my life. And yeah. that's that young love, that deep love. We fell in love head over yeah. heels. Yeah. And I think like since kids, our strength has always been like communication. Absolutely. Like yeah. we communicate yeah. very well. So that, that, like from that, that was from the beginning. And her mom... Hated me. Oh my god. Yes, she did not like him. She at all. used to chase me home from school. Like, yo, like yo, she, she'll pull up to the school, like, yo, come here. She's Puerto Rican lady. Come here. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. So like uh so after so after us being like so in love, uh she ended up getting pregnant. 
And when we had our kids, like, we didn't plan twin boys, but, like, we wanted a family, being that we both came from broken homes. I remember we were kids, we were crazy. Like, I was at basketball camp when she called me, and she was like, ah, when you get, I was gone for, like, two weeks. She's like, when you get back, let's have a baby. And I'm like, yeah, all right, let's have a baby. And, like, sure enough, I came back from basketball camp, and she was pregnant. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it was... And that's the thing, like, you know, we was just young and I, I, I know that we didn't have the guidance or nobody to tell us like, all right, you guys, you should wait, you should, you know, take precautions, you know, do it this way, right? It was just, if I even told my mom I liked the boy, she was going off, like, she didn't even play that, like, we're not even going to do that, right? So, um, you know, with him, it was like, man, like, I've always desired that family structure because like you said, I didn't have that, we didn't have that. So it was kind of like we had our, we were madly in love we knew we came from broken homes and we wanted a home. Um, and then we was like, yeah, we just gonna do it. So it wasn't a mistake. Our boys were not a mistake. Right. A lot of teen parents, they'd be like, oh, it was an accident. Like for us, it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> we but we thought like, it was gonna be one. Yeah, mm-hmm. but that's one thing we did. We did not expect to have twin identical boys at me being 15 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a whole journey in itself. That was crazy. Um, but fast forward in a little bit after that, um, we've been through so much, even in those beginning stages and just trying to navigate life, yeah. trying to grow not only as teenagers, right, but as parents now, yeah. literally babies raising other babies. So yeah. we definitely been through a lot when it came to, um, you know, just our relationship and the dyna- dynamic of our relationship. It was rocky. Yeah, because, like, after the, we had the boys, the relationship, like, went left. Yeah. It went so left. I think, like, like me, I was, like, a deadbeat dad. I'd be around the kids. I'd see her and the kids, like, every three months. I was, like, this close from, like, child support. Like, that close from child support. Her mom wanted to put me on child support. She, Many times. She, she loves like, me now, but back then. She loves you so much she, now. Yeah, <laughs> she, she hated me because I was just always in and out. But anytime yeah. I came back, she would always, like... Love me like I never left. So that was a crazy thing. But we did each other wrong. Like as far as like. A lot. A lot. It was was bad. You know, we've been through everything you could think of. I had baby mama drama at 17. And then like throughout that time that we were separated, we were having like our own personal experiences, like leading up to coming to God. Um, I was actually, uh, I actually joined a uh, secret society. Uh, My father was invited and I took their doctrine and I studied it and it surrounded my life with darkness. Like I've seen darkness on levels that make people's heads spin. And even to this day, I know that there are people that are part of the society that never speak on it. And I used to be afraid to speak on it, but I know that God has me protected. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, yeah, I've just, it just, at that point, like I just became like a really dark careless person i didn't care about her i didn't care about the kids at one point i was barely seeing them i was just always high drunk or partying Mm. and um man it just we had like i had a crazy encounter with god i was just like all right you know i already i was an atheist i didn't believe anything i was like all right god i just got to a low point in my life at this time she was living in a shelter with uh our sons Mm -hmm. i was in a situation with a girl i was living with her And I was just looking at my life and I'm like, yo, like this can't be it. Uh, One of my close friends had died in a car accident. And when he died, I was just looking for answers. Like, all right, like there has to be something else after this. Like my bro was here and now he's dead. Like what's next? Mm -hmm. And I just remember being at his funeral and everybody's crying over the grave. And I was just like, you know, God, if you're real, I need you now. I remember I had a 1987 Chevy Caprice. I was sitting in my Chevy, I was smoking a cigarette, and I was bawling tears because if God was real in that moment, I was like, you know, I need him now. And Mm -hmm. I was just like, God, you know, I messed my life up. I've gone as far as I can go by myself. Mm -hmm. And if you're real, I need you to show me. And if you don't, I don't know if I'll make it. Mm. And um, when I got to that point, it was just like little things started happening that were undeniable that he was real. And the one thing that happened that really shocked me was, um, so I was in a situation with this girl I was with, I was living with her, and I was like, you know, God, if this is who you want me to be with, I need you to show me, because I'm tired. Like, I'm tired of just messing with everybody. I'm tired of just this lifestyle that I'm in. I just want to change. 
And like nobody ministered to me and told me about Jesus. It just hit me like a revelation. Like you hear about miracles. You hear about people being blessed. You hear about people just having peace. It came to me just like this. Why don't you go to church? So I started going to church every Sunday. I would just get up, get dressed and go. Get up, get dressed and go. And I was like, with the girl I was with, I was like, hey, you want to come to church with me? And she was like, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. No problem. I'll go. And I went with her to church. I'm like, okay, this is a good sign. And while we're sitting in the service, I'm like, uh, God. I don't know. This is, this, this is crazy now that I think back because I feel like it was even him putting it in my heart yeah. for me to ask him this in the service for him to show me that he was real. So I'm like, God, if this is who you want me with, show me right now. Right now in this moment. I'm saying I'm sitting in the service and I'm sitting next to her. And as soon as I said that, I looked over at her. And she's making like googly, freaky eyes with the guy on the drums. Jesus. And he's doing it back in the church. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is real. So I said, okay, God, I'm in a situation where I'm living with this person. I need you to get me out of this situation. I don't know how, but I know I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. And uh, a week after that, I get a phone call from Cass. And she calls me. She's like, hey, how you been? And I'm like, I've been good. How you been? And she goes, I started going to church. I gave my life to God. And I'm like, you a liar. <laughs> you ain't nothing but the devil. You're lying. You started going to church. And she's like, no, I really gave my life to Christ. Yeah. And um, yeah. I think that's what set it off. Yeah. And for me, leading up to that moment where I gave my life to Christ, it was like, I... Listen, I was just out there. Like, I was wanted to party with my girls. We wanted to be in Philly on South Street, like, turning up. We wanted to be on the, on the scene. Like, wherever there was a turn up, we had to be there. And a lot of that was because, like, me having kids young, it kind of suck away from my, you know, teenage years. I didn't really have time to, like, hang out with friends and things like that. So the moment I got a little bit of freedom, I was like, oh, it's up. Like, yeah, yeah like, I'm, I'm turning up. Like, and I went crazy, like, you know, doing drugs and alcohol. Through the streets. Yes, yeah. <laughs> very, very much so, you know. <laughs> like, just really, you know, off the hook. And even me, you know, being, like, a mom, like, just leaving the kids with my mom. She was, like, basically their mom for a long time. Like, I would just be out. I wouldn't come home. And things like that but um you know so for me i realized that i needed a change as well i was broken i was hurt you know i was still again trying to heal from all of that past trauma didn't have any type of direction nobody to talk to nobody to go to but my friends who didn't even know what they was doing with their life right. so you know for me it really took me hitting rock bottom to the point where it was like lord i i need you right i need you like never before right now in this moment or I don't know where to, if there is a tomorrow for me right. that's how deep it got for me like I didn't know and then I had that we had the boys and when they started getting older they was just like off the hook like they was <laughs> bad. bad little kids I'm like dang like I'm, listen they was bad okay but for me trying to deal with that and then still trying to deal with you know, now that I look at it, they weren't bad kids. They were just very hyper energetic. And I didn't know how to deal with that, being a, a person coming up, you know, um, still a baby, having a baby. So, yeah. but that's what it took for me. It took me getting to my lowest point to be like, you know what, God, I need you, right? I need you in this moment. And that's when I started finding myself going to church and, yeah. you know, trying to um, build a relationship with God. And then he calls me and we're like, okay, boom, now we're going to try to work this thing out. And, and but then, go ahead, what go I want to say go is, <laughs> although the reality of it is, although we both had our experience where we are trying to be right in the sight of God and come together, it was still rocky. It was bad. Oh my we God. was like was still bad. like, I was still halfway in the streets, right. like for the streets, the halfway yeah. for, for the man. So I'm like, look, I don't, I don't know yet. And because, you know, that look <laughs> in that part of the story, it looks like, all right, that's the point where we get back together and everything gets good. And yeah. it goes up, but no, it actually went left. Yeah, like, it did. We ended up moving back in together, and she was still partying. I was still partying. I was, you know, had a little, you know, on the side, and she had like a little, you know, on the side. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so bad. Like, we used to just fight, and we used just to just argue all the time. Yeah. And uh, God really put me in a place. It's like a whole story, but like, this is the short version of it. God had put me in a place where. He completely shifted my mentality and my mm -hmm. desires. Mm -hmm. And I lost desire for like 
smoking, drinking, partying. Like, our relationship had got so bad before, like, this mental shift happened. I was ready to leave. Like, I remember one time packing. So, like, at this time, I'm still building my relationship with God, but I was just fed up. So I started, I started uh, packing all my stuff. I mean, I, I packed everything I had, and I was with a buddy of mine. And I was like, yeah, when she come home, she's not even going to find a sock. I'm out of here. Like, I packed everything. I packed up my car. And I'm with my homie, and my priorities were so messed up. He was like, all right, bro, you can come stay at my house. You know what I mean? Like, we'll just thug it out like we always did. So I'm like, all right, bet. Packed up the car. Instead of going to his house and dropping my stuff off, he was like, nah, we'll drop it off after the party. So I'm like, all right, bet. So... I, here I am, I'm in my car, I got a whole bunch of stuff. I'm like, bro, I gotta stop for gas. I pull up at the gas station and I'm tapping. I'm like, bro, do you see my wallet? He's like, nah. He's like, you had it. He said, you had it. I saw you grab it when we left the house. And I'm like, nah, I can't find my wallet. I was like, I started looking, I hopped out the car, checked under the seat. And then I heard a voice say, your wallet is at the house. And I was like, bro. I think my wallet's at the house. And if my wallet is at the house, I need to unpack everything in this car and I need to go back. And he's like, bro, you're tripping. I saw you grab the wallet. I saw you grab the wallet. I'm like, bro, something just told me my wallet is at the house. And if my wallet is at the crib, I need you to unpack this car. I'll take you where you got to go. And I'm going home. And sure enough, I walk in the house. (laughs) It was right on the table. I mean, I walked in and I couldn't miss it. It was like, it was something that you couldn't miss. And I feel like God was saying like, in that moment, he was saying, if you leave, you'll never have anything. You'll never have anything. So I stayed. I stayed. And like, God had got me in a place where it was like, man, I just, I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. I stopped partying. I cut off the people that I was with. But she was still for the streets. And I'm like... (laughs) I'm like, you know what, God, this is what I'm going to do. You're either going to make a wife out of her or you're going to bring me a wife. Whatever you do, I'm done. Like, you're either going to change her or you're going to bring me a wife, but I'm done with the life that I live. Like I said, it's a whole story to come out later. But, you know, instead of fighting with her, I started praying for her. Yeah. And, like, I remember, like, man, I come home. You know, I was carrying my Bible. I had my first Bible. I was Christian. I was super Christian. Like, you couldn't tell me nothing. I used to sleep with my Bible. I had my Bible. And, like, I came home one day, and the house was, like, they hotboxed the bathroom. You know what I'm saying? Like, here I am trying to be Christian. She got the house all smoked up. And I'm like, yo, you smoked up the house? And her and her friend laughing, like, ha, ha, why you mad? Why you mad? And they just, like, I stayed through all of that, and, like, I was just like, you know what, God, you're either going to make me a wife or you're going to bring me a wife. Either mm-hmm. way, I'm not going back. And, and I, do, that's the, I just want to say, too, yeah. like, that's the, a testament of, like, prayer. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. while you over there praying, little, I'm over here on this side, little did you know, with thoughts like, man, I got to get my life together. Right. Like, hearing, like, oh, wow, this, this ain't right. Like, I ain't supposed to be here. Having those feelings, so it's like because you're sending them prayers up to God, I'm over here and things are shifting in my mind right. and in my heart. And now I'm losing the desire to be out. And now I don't want to be around these people. And now I'm missing home. Like I need to be with my kids, my 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 boyfriend, boyfriend. at the time, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. So the shift happened as you were in that prayer mode too. But fast forward a little bit um, to us like building our relationship really and just being steadfast in the things of God, it took us to be attached to a ministry. Like we yeah. went to like a Bible based ministry that really taught us the things of God. And yeah. they really explained to us like how we not necessarily should live, but they explained the love of Jesus to us. Yeah. They gave us a good foundation. They gave us a great foundation. And by us knowing the love of Jesus, it helped us to change our, our day to day. Like even before he didn't want to get married, he was yeah. like, are we not getting married or we'll wait five years. We'll wait 10 years, get my money you know, up. Like, get my money yeah. up. like the finances, yeah. right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't even with it, but you know, we went to this ministry and they begin to teach us biblical principles and they begin to teach us, you know, the things of God and how marriage is honorable in the sight of God and yeah. things like that. So, you know, it really allowed us to shift our whole mindset, shift our whole life. Yeah. Cause like, it was like deep, like the church that we ran was so deep. Like, we would be out, you know, doing our thing the night before, and we go to church. And the, <laughs> the pastor get up on the pulpit like, yes, and God said, and then he'll stop. 
And he'll look at us and he'll say, the Lord said there's fornicators in the camp. And we looking at each other like, oh, you made me do it. <laughs> so it was like, I'm tired. It was it's, very prophetic. They was seeing. It was I'm like, deep. I, like, I'm like, yo, God. Like, I'm like, if we would like, it was just, yeah. we had to be there. And it's crazy because yeah. we stayed in that ministry for nine years. Yes, we did. And it gave us the foundation that we needed to be here. Like, we preached for like, what, nine years? Yeah. And I don't have one recording. I just never recorded it, so it's like it never happened. But we preached for like nine years. We sat yeah. in the ministry, and we seen miracles. And God kind of prepared us for the move to California. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It taught us so much just being in ministry too, like yeah. about servitude, like and what that means towards God, and how yeah. even the the Bible says like uh, the one that's a servant. The one that's serving is the one that's greater yeah, among you, all, yeah. amongst you, right? Yeah. The one that's serving. So it just taught us so much, so much about just life itself. And like he said, you know, we wouldn't be the people we are today if we didn't have that foundation. Yeah. We yeah. wouldn't have been able to drive across the country and come to L.A. Um, and start a whole new life here and yeah. still be rooted in Christ. Yeah. We yeah. had that, that structure and that foundation to allow us to stand, right? Because L.A., yeah. as we know, is... A, it, can, it is what it is. You know, if you know, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could really easily get in the mix and, you know, get into some things. But by God's grace, he was able to lead and guide us and get us where we need to be. Yeah, and we really came out here for uh, a better life. Mm -hmm. I think, like, everybody that we were connected to. Because, like, Trenton and, like, Mooresville, even though Mooresville, you talked about Mooresville earlier, yeah. it's, like, a better, more suburban area. But it's, like, 10 minutes walking distance. It's, right. like, a bridge. It's so, like... <laughs> When you make it to Mooresville, it's like, yeah, I made it, da, 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 I'm out the hood. But it's like the hood is right there. It's right, like literally. walking distance. And so like everybody, like a lot of the people that we were connected to were like struggling. And we struggled too. Like we've been evicted. We've lost cars. Mm -hmm. We've like had the homeless, heat. Homeless. Living in hotels. Living in hotels. Had the heat shut off on us. And like we got to right before moving here, we were living in a hotel. And um, we got to a point where it was like, yo, like, I feel like now is the time to take the leap to California. Mm -hmm. And like, there was so much going on, like financially, I was working and she was working, but it was mm -hmm. just like, our landlord decided that they didn't want to extend the lease. And we tried to stay with family members and they didn't want us to stay with them. It was just like weird. It was almost as if Jersey kicked us out. Yeah, or God. It was God, God used Jersey to kick us out. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I, I even going back to like one thing I always say is like in situations that happen in life, it's yeah. always like it had to happen. Yeah. Because if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Like right. if that situation didn't happen and I'm pushing us out, we probably would have never made it to LA because we was comfortable. We right. was good. Like we was living nice. We was in Ben Salem. We was in the burbs. The kids was in school good. Yeah, like so true. it was no reason for us to really want to leave. Right. Right, but it took that moment of like, what in the world is going on right now? Yeah, to really like push us out and be like, you know what, we need something different because as we look at our life over the past, you know, couple years that we've been in church and we've been back together, it's like, man, like we really struggled, like we, we struggled. really struggled yeah. bad, Hard, like bad. trying to just make ends meet. So it's like we, in our mind, it's like, okay, we need to be able to break that cycle. Right. We need to be able to do something different to get a different result. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of forced us. Like, I feel like God really forced us to LA. Yeah. It was like, you're going to be there. Yeah. Like, yeah. cause yeah. I have work for you there. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was really the leading of God that allowed us to come to LA. Now, the crazy thing is the scripture that I love is Proverbs three and five. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Yeah. That's one of my life scriptures right there because that's exactly what we did coming out yeah. here. We were desperate. We were desperate <laughs> and we were like, you know what, Lord, you direct us, you lead our paths, you mm -hmm. show us which way we're supposed to be going. You know, we honor you and we acknowledge you in this. Yeah. And as we did this, he did the latter part. He directed our steps, right? Yeah. He, he showed us the places that we need to go. But um, going into like the Christian club, <laughs> we well, we, no, when we moved out here, we didn't even have jobs. We had an air mattress. Yeah, it was deep. Like was we crazy. was really starting from scratch. Like we packed up our car. We had just a few items, and it's so crazy because I'm at the U-Haul place trying to get the truck attached to the car. I, I forget what that thing is called. The, the, Whatever it is, the, the, the yeah, you gotta attach it to the car, and then you put your stuff back there and drive right. I'm, we at U-Haul trying to get it, and they're like, oh, no, it won't attach. You can't bring this stuff. Like, there's no way. And we were scheduled to leave the night before or something like that. 
So we couldn't bring anything with us. We literally had a couple of clothes. Yeah. I think we was able to fit like a TV back there and that was really it. That and then the it. kids, because it was a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> so it was four of them now. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we just drove across the country and we was like, you know what? At the end of the day, if it don't work out, we know where home is. We can always go back home. We can always, you know, pivot and and go from there. But we was like, yeah, we got to try something out. We got to try something new. And thank God that we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, then, you know, coming to California, like the club wasn't something that we wanted to do. Well, had planned to do. So it wasn't like we were on the East Coast, like, man, let's move to California and start a Christian club. What happened was that when we got here, God started sending us like community yeah, and people like he would let people just gravitate to us. And like we'd get invited to like birthday parties and like different things like events, Bible studies and stuff like that because of the church we're connected to. And like people would be like, oh, man, I saw you guys here on Instagram. I didn't get an invite. So then we started thinking like, man, we really need a place where we can bring people and create like a community where everybody can come and just have a good time. Yeah. And then, then we were driving home back from somewhere and the Lord dropped and gave us, he said, the Safe Social Club. Brought and he it gave, back up. He brought it back up because he gave us the idea in 2018. We still have like, uh, in her notes, we have a picture of uh, the club idea and how it was going to be laid out and what it would be. So it was just timing. It felt like the perfect time to do it. Yeah, for sure. And I think what... Um it was for me. I remember, again, we were in church a very long time. We served with our whole entire hearts. We gave our life to ministry. And I remember, I'm like, man, babe, I just want to go dance somewhere. Like, I just want to go have a good time. I'm just trying to vibe. But there was no outlets for us at all. It was only, you know, secular clubs. And then there's alcohol there. There's all of this other stuff that we came out of. So Mm -hmm. we don't want to put ourselves back in those situations Mm -hmm. because then we're in a position where it's like we can compromise our, our sanctification we can compromise our walk with God but but the thought of a like the thought of a Christian club we didn't even think of that so when you're talking about dancing like we we like in strict our old church was strict so she's yeah. talking about dancing I'm like what type of dance are you right, do right. you want to go twerk or something yeah. Yeah. but she it was different we come yeah. from like a different I'm sorry I shouldn't have said that I'm sorry no no it's cool <laughs> Like, no. Yeah, no, but that's kind of what it stemmed from. Like, we really just wanted a place where believers can come together to have a good time, to have fellowship, to love on each other. And then it's also an outlet for unbelievers as well. Right. And that's what we tell people. It's like a two-part thing. Like, yeah, it's for us, but it's also for other non-believers who maybe they don't want to step foot in the church or, yeah. you know, they maybe had a bad experience in church or for whatever reason, they're not drawn to the church. But if... Their friend be like, yo, come to this club with me. Come to this Christian club. Yeah. Then they'll most likely come. And then little do they know they're going to experience Jesus in a whole nother way. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's extremely important for us to, was when we were creating this, to create a space where people can uh, re-engage uh, kingdom culture. Right. Because a lot of times when people have like church hurt or they get hurt by church people, they get stuck in that moment of time when they encounter somebody from church. So if it's like, like I had a guy say like, oh, what are you guys going to be doing there? Singing hymns? And I'm like, bro, like, I the, the last time they were singing hymns in church was like 1960. When is the last time you've right. been to church? And he's like, man, I'm a recovering Christian. I just came back. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Right. So it's very important that we, like, I remember one time I did a show. Maybe, maybe. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, can I say it? Okay. Can I just say it? <laughs> I did a show in Delaware. And like, and I was under the impression that the event that I was doing was a Christian show. So I go there with my brothers, we do our Christian song and we turn it up like, yeah, Jesus name, da 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 And like nine o'clock hit, they start pulling bottles out, they start sparking up. And I'm like, bro, this is not a Christian <laughs> event. And I was trying to figure out like, why aren't they bopping? This is fire. But I realized like, okay, this is not, this is not a Christian space. And it's almost like dope because I see people coming into the club and seeing like, oh, this is a vibe. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, oh, man, these people are so nice. Oh, man, the music is dope. And they're like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did he just say Jesus? Like, did that rapper just say Jesus? Oh, this is a Christian club. So I see a lot of people having that experience, and that's Mm -hmm. who this is for. I mean, it's a good place for believers to come, but it's dope for people that don't know Christ to come and encounter him in this space. That's the goal. So if you guys want to learn more about the Save Social Club, you can reach us on our website, thesavesocialclub.com. 
We have our Instagram account as well, at the Save Social Club. If you guys are interested in partnering with us and sponsoring any of our events, please email us at support at the Save Social Club.com. Or if you have any questions, feedback, want to learn more, we are here and available to make sure we can answer all of your questions. Super grateful, super blessed to be able to create this space for you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much for, you know, just being receptive to it and um, allowing us to make change in the neighborhood. We're located in North Hollywood, yeah. um, right on Magnolia. We God put us in the right in the center. <laughs> so um, we again, we just thank you guys for all your love and your support. Until next time. You ain't look my way, I was down bad. They just let me fall, but I bounce back. But I bounce back. You ain't look my way, I was down bad. But I bounce back. But I bounce back. You ain't look my way, I was down bad. They just let me fall, but I bounce back. Had to look to God just to get back. Yeah, had to look to God just to get back. You ain't look my way, I was down bad. They just let me fall, but I bounce back. Had to look to God just to get back. Yeah, had to look to God just to get back. My circle got smaller than I leveled up. Anyone can get it, but they mad at us. Who you know got change, ain't change up. I don't want the fame, I just wanna build you. We gon' build the city from the ground up. When they ask me how it happened, I say Jesus did it. Guess that's why I'm chosen, I'm just too committed. We ain't had nothing, so I gotta get it. You ain't look my way, I was down bad They just let me fall, but I bounce back